Hello, it's Mr Lund here. Um, if your teacher has changed this first slide, they'll be introducing themselves now. Otherwise, it's me. Hello, Year 8, and welcome to the new topic of the Earth structure or the Earth system, rocks, etc. Um, and we're starting off with looking at what is the Earth made of. Now, I'm Mr Lund. Uh, you probably know me. If you don't, hello. Um, I am going to be doing this bit for Year 8s, and so your normal teacher will be setting you the work, but you'll be getting these uh, PowerPoints created and presented by me. So apologies if you, A, find my voice annoying, or B, don't like my style of presentation, but uh, I'm afraid you're going to have to live with it. So do feel free to email me feedback, tell me things you like, don't like. I've included quite a lot of stretch and challenge in this PowerPoint, and a few, and I'll highlight the basic points as well to try and make sure you've got scope to do stretchy things if you want to really ex extend yourselves or not depending on what you are feeling so uh, let's get on with it so our objectives for our first lesson of earth structure we're looking at the structure of the earth and its atmosphere and then i've put a couple of things in that sort of go on from there the key learning really that you need to take away is you need to know the internal structure of the earth and the composition of its atmosphere if you can recall and describe those two features, then you've got the key learning from this lesson. In addition to that, I've added um, the idea that we could perhaps be able to look at how we came about our understanding of the Earth's internal structure, because it's not easy to do. And lastly, there's an extension about plate tectonics, which will tie in with geography, uh, with a few slight changes. So. First part, what is the Earth made of? Well, we're going to look at the two parts, and these are these are slightly higher level words, which you feel free to sort of ignore. You do need the word atmosphere, but geosphere is essentially all of the solid bits of the Earth. The atmosphere is the gases that surround it. There's a third one, or in fact, there's a fourth one. There's the hydrosphere, which is the water, and the biosphere, which is all of the living things, generally the terrestrial living things. We include the, bio, uh, the um, marine living things in the hydrosphere. So the atmosphere is the layer of gases that surround our planet. Now, these are really important for our survival because, of course, we need to take oxygen from them. And they also protect us. They thermally insulate our planet, keeping its temperature high enough that everything doesn't freeze solid, but not so high we all cook. We don't want to be like Venus with a surface temperature of 400 plus degrees C where it can melt lead and space probes can survive there for hours at best. We don't want to be like Mars where, you know, average daytime temperature is minus 30 or minus 40. And... Um, Basically, the lack of atmosphere means that all the water is solid, which isn't particularly useful either. So the atmosphere is very important to our survival. Now, you need to be able to recall its composition. And the atmosphere is made of the following gases. Now, if I asked you what's in the air, the air around us, you'd probably all say oxygen, which is true. And it is the second most important component in our atmosphere. But the most important component, surprisingly, is nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up the vast majority of our atmosphere, and it is pretty inert. It doesn't really do a lot, which is kind of useful, because things get very exciting with an awful lot of oxygen, and fires get rather more vicious. Uh, survival becomes a bit more difficult because in large concentrations oxygen is pretty toxic um, and so actually having a nice inert gas like nitrogen as the majority of our uh, atmosphere is quite beneficial to us. We've then got about 21% oxygen and then we've got about 0.1% argon and then a mixture of other gases making up less than a tenth of well, a bit more than a tenth of a percent and then a very tiny fraction is carbon dioxide of course that value the 0.3 is under review at the moment, that's a rather older figure, the 0.03. The 0.04 is probably more current, and of course we are busily adding to that on a daily basis, so the uh, number of parts per million carbon dioxide is steadily increasing. So those are the basic components. The two you're really likely to get examined on are the nitrogen and the oxygen. So, next thing is that's the atmosphere, and measuring the atmosphere is relatively easy. You just need some chemical tests or some kind of sensor to effectively measure the atmosphere. What you also need to be able to do, however, for this lesson is know what's underneath our feet in the solid Earth, or we call it the solid Earth, even though it's not all solid, uh, in the geosphere. So how might you be able to do that? Uh, 
Ah, here we are, the geosphere. So basically, when we talk about the geosphere, we talk about all the things in and below the solid Earth. Now, it's not all solid, but I say solid Earth, meaning essentially the rock under our feet and down to the core. So how do we know about these parts? So I'm going to ask you to have a think, pause the video if you'd like, and just have a think. How could we know what is deep inside the Earth? I mean, it's fairly obvious how we know what's at the surface of the Earth, because, you know, you can walk over to it and pick it up and look at it. But how do we know deeper than that? And how do we know much deeper than that? Unpause when you're ready. So, our modern understanding of the Earth's internal structure comes from a variety of different sources. One of the sort of obvious ones is the overall shape of the Earth we can take from, well, the ancient Greeks knew what shape the Earth was. We've never really had a time in history where we've actually believed it's flat. The story of Columbus thinking he's going to fall off the edge of the Earth is pretty nonsensical because any mariner knows that the surface of the sea is curved. And if the surface of the sea is curved, you know that you're going to keep going round. Um, flat Earth is really a new thing, despite some slightly simplistic historical books. Uh, so and we've also got a lot more evidence of this now, rather than just doing trigonometry or just noticing that if you sail south, the day changes, the height of the sun changes. Um, you can actually now see pictures of the Earth taken by satellites. We've got low altitude satellites um, on polar orbits that can take altimeter readings very precisely of the sea surface, of the surface of the seabed, of the land surface, etc. So we now know very accurately the shape of the Earth, its diameter, its radius at certain points, and we know exactly what shape it is down to really quite precise levels, sort of sub-meter, sub-centimeter sometimes measurements. Um, we call that the shape of the Earth isn't really a sphere, it's called an oblate spheroid because it's spinning fast enough to push matter out at the equator. So actually, if you imagine you've got a large football and you squeeze the top and the bottom down, and so the middle sticks out a bit more, that's more the shape of the Earth, but only very slightly oblate. It's only very slightly squashed at the poles. Okay, so we've got data from a modern technology like satellites. Uh, we can take samples. Geologists with little hammers have been for hundreds of thousands of years wondering, oh, well, they weren't geologists for hundreds of thousands of years, they've been geologists for a couple of hundred years, but people have been going and digging up bits of rock for many, many years. And we can take those from the ground, just lying around near you where it outcrops, or you can collect rocks from a bit deeper by taking volcanic rocks, which give you an idea about the composition down at the magma, where, where the magma is being produced. And you can collect chemistry data, what those rocks are made out of when they erupt and the surface data of rocks and see what those rocks are like. Um, we know how much we weigh on Earth. And thanks to Sir Isaac Newton and modern revisions, we know how, therefore, how dense and how massive the Earth is based on how much force gravity exerts at any given point on the Earth's surface. So we can calculate how big the Earth is how dense it is and how much gravity it by using how much gravity it exerts on us. And lastly, although not exhaustively, and I said uh, we can use uh, we can use seismic data. Now, I'm sure most of you said, oh, you can dig a hole and you can dig a hole. But really, we're actually pretty limited on hole digging. Mines don't go down very far. Really modern mining equipment. I think the record now is that they're starting to work on mines that might be theoretically able to go down somewhere in the region of uh, 10 to 20 kilometers. But those are unmanned. Those are borers. And they are, you know, really serious pieces of kit because 20 kilometers is thicker than the Earth's crust in the ocean and a third of the way down through um, continental crust. And by that depth, it's starting to get really quite hot and really quite plastic deformation. -y. So the chances of a human surviving in conditions at 20 kilometer depth are pretty much nil and you need very specialist equipment to get anything down there so we we are really are limited to very shallow digging operations and very shallow samples right let's have a look at the seismic pathways these are called earthquake data and this is actually our main source of understanding of the structure of the earth or at least the complex deep structure so obviously big earthquakes are seriously scary things um, and they can do an awful lot of damage to cities and other human infrastructure, not to mention human life. However, whilst they can collapse roads and demolish tower blocks, etc., they do have occasionally some rather useful net benefits. Well, not net, obviously, sorry. They do have some side benefits despite their destructive power. And that is when they happen, 
the amount of energy released into the Earth's crust is enormous, or the Earth's lithosphere. And that energy propagates as waves, shock waves, through the Earth. And this is what the earthquake actually is, it's these shock waves. But even if you're a long, long way away from the site of the earthquake, the focus or the, um, I can't remember the name of the top part, the, the surface centre, the one everyone talks about, the epicentre, that's it. Uh, even if you're a long way away from the focus of an earthquake, you still get, you still can get very measurable waves. In fact, even across the far side of the planet, you can get detect seismic waves from the largest earthquakes. And incidentally, nuclear weapons. We learned a lot of this because of nuclear testing. The Americans built an awful lot of listening stations to check out Russian bombs, where they were testing bombs to see if they could work out what the bombs were, etc. So actually quite a lot of our seismic data comes from old military installations that were trying to keep an eye on the Russians. Okay, so there are, in fact, there are more than two types of surface waves, and there are two types of body waves, which are the ones that move through homo homogeneous uh, substances. So the two types of seismic wave you really need to be aware of, at least in future GCSE, not today. This is kind of an introduction to how we know this stuff, because we we can cover what the key knowledge is in about two slides. But this is kind of interesting extra. There are two types of seismic wave, P waves and S waves. There are also two types of surface waves, and these are the ones that do most of the damage during an actual earthquake. But they're very short ranged and pretty useless for seismologists. So sound waves are longitudinal. That means the vibrations occur in the direction of wave propagation. So as the wave goes this way, any given particle is just going backwards and forwards, left to right. And so that's like sound. It's called a longitudinal wave. Now, these waves can propagate through any medium, even if it's a gas, hence why we can hear in the air very efficiently. The second kind of seismic wave we're looking at are S waves. These are transverse. Particles here vibrate up, and down. Now, in all, and that, as the wave is propagating to the right or to the left, so these waves go up. These particles vibrate up and down as the wave propagates right. They, prop, they vibrate perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Now, this works best when there are chemical links between the particles. So, for the purposes of this PowerPoint and model, S waves propagate best in solids and don't really propagate very well in liquids. I mean, I know you see waves on the sea, but those are A, truly surface waves, and B, water doesn't behave like a pure liquid. It's something like 80% hydrogen bonded. So it, it does actually behave in a fairly solid way. It's not a, very, it's not a very perfect liquid. So this kind of up and down wave propagates far better in solids and is very poor at propagating in liquids. Okay, so. Uh, what I've got here is a little bit of a very simplified model of looking at how we understand the internal structure of the Earth. We're going to use three basic rules. P waves can travel in solids and liquids. S waves can only travel through solids. And any wave travels faster through a more dense material than a less dense material. And that wave time is going to be important later on to have a look at some really internal stuff. So I'm not setting you this activity to do, but I'll show you the effect it has. Now, the data is on a separate slide, so I'll, show, I'll talk about that in a second. But fundamentally, what we're looking at is this. We've got an earthquake happening at point A. Now, this earthquake can transmit, and we're going to draw the P waves in yellow and the S waves in blue. Now, a P wave can be recorded as traveling, I'm going to use a darker yellow than that, as traveling from A to B, a to C, A to D, A to E, this would be much nicer with a ruler, and so on, all the way through the planet. Whereas, and I'm not going to do all of them because there's an animated slide, there's a slide in it with them all drawn on already. Whereas an S wave can't reach all of those locations. And this tells us something, because if S waves can reach point E but not point F, there must be something here in the middle. We'll have a look at that in a second. Our second piece of data is that there are actually faster waves. The P waves traveling through the middle of the Earth travel faster. And I'll show you that plot in a moment. But before we do that, let's have a look. there's the data that I made up. Earthquake 1 started at point A and was then detected at all of these places, P waves, and all of these places as S waves. Earthquake 2 started at point E and went to those places and those places. Now. If I show you the graph, we're going to have a think about what is it trying to tell us. Is the Earth solid? Is the Earth liquid all the way through? 
Is there a liquid layer on the outside, solid on the inside, or is there a solid layer outside and a liquid layer on the inside? Well, here's what we can see. You can see that P waves can pass to all the points around the whole planet, and they're the ones that can propagate through any state of matter. Whereas the blue lines and the teal lines are the S waves. So these can't propagate through the center of the Earth. What does that suggest to us about the center of the Earth, remembering the rules? P waves propagate through any state. S waves struggle to propagate through liquids. So this would tell me that this boundary here is a solid liquid interface where the outside of that line is a solid, and inside of that line is a liquid. So using this basic model, this basic faked seismic data, we can say that actually we know that inside the Earth there's a large volume of liquid. And we call that the outer core. Okay, second part of the data looks very simply at P waves moving faster if they pass through the center of the Earth. And this is slightly contrived from my part. But what this tells us is that the core itself is not just a homogeneous ball of liquid. It's actually got a solid in the center. Now, there we go. This diagrammatic representation, again, is massively simplified and doesn't take refraction into account. I'll show you the real version in a second. But fundamentally, we've got to the idea that the out, we've got solid for a good depth, and then a liquid for a good depth, and then something much denser than liquid, which again, we're going to call solid, right in the center. And this gives us our fundamental Earth structure. Now, I've missed off the top layer here, but that's because we can actually dig into that and look at it. The structure of the Earth is as follows. There is the crust. This varies from about six kilometers under ocean up to sort of 40 kilometers under mountain ranges. In fact, under some big mountain ranges, it may be even thicker than that. Uh, then we have the mantle. The mantle is a very, very interesting place, and it's where our plate tectonics is derived. The mantle is solid rock. However, at very low, very low depths, quite close to the surface, if it's got enough volatiles in it, it can cause melts to occur, and that generates volcanic activity. However, because this solid rock in the mantle is under extreme temperature and pressure, it can behave in a viscous way. Imagine custard powder with water mix, that oobleck mix that everyone's so keen on because it's quite fun. That oobleck mix, if you press it, behaves as a solid. If you leave it, it flows. The mantle is like that, but on a million-year time scale. If you leave it alone, it flows. But short time scale pressure and uh, short time scale action will cause it to behave as a solid. So the mantle is incredibly dense, incredibly solid, incredibly viscous, far more viscous than glass or concrete are as solids. But because of the extreme temperature and pressure, very slowly it can regrow its crystals and can change shape, which allows it to flow very slowly, but flow nonetheless. We then get to the outer core. The outer core is a liquid iron and nickel alloy. It's got a load of other heavy metals like uranium and things like that in it, uh, but mostly it's nickel and iron as far as we know. And the inner core is solid nickel and iron. And that inner core is slowly building up as the outer core cools, uh, drops below a certain transition temperature and then plates the outside of the inner core as a solid. So slowly over the life of the Earth, that inner core will grow and gradually use up more and more of the liquid outer core. The liquid outer core is very important because it convects, and these convection cells generate our magnetic field. And we've got three big convection cells, not very good drawing, we've got three big convection cells in the outer core that drive, or should have three, that drive the three kind of component electromagnets that make up the Earth's magnetic field. One of those is currently failing or has failed, so we've currently got two big electromagnetic cells working in the Earth's inner outer core. Okay, the inner core, I said solid, nickel and iron and other heavy metals. You need to know the names, actually really you need to know the core rather than the inner and outer core, the mantle and the crust. You need to know the crust is brittle rocks, the mantle is able to flow slowly, and you need to know that the core is made up of liquid iron and nickel or solid iron and nickel. Those are the key bits of information. So that's really the second thing you need to know. The percent gases is the most important thing for the first part of the PowerPoint. And these four key layers are the most important thing for the second part of the PowerPoint. Moving on. 
So this is really extension stuff. This is looking at what actually these seismic graph traces look like. And you can hear, see here the P waves and S waves refracting due to change in density in the Earth uh, from the crust around. So you get this point here where you get both P and S waves. And then you get this big shadow here where you don't get any P waves propagating. And then down here you get more P waves propagating. And you can see this fine structure with the inside of the Earth based on this change in density changes and change in states that allow you to get a shadow zone where you don't get any P waves propagating through the Earth's, uh, Earth's mantle. So that's our real, real evidence on how you can see the internal structure of the Earth. I thought I'd show you the proper one rather than just giving the um, mind made up draw straight line to the ruler type silliness. OK, so again, more extension here. We're looking at tectonics and the fact that our, our Earth still behaves in a living way. It's still a, a, a geologically living planet. And that is because it's still got all that residual heat in the core and the mantle is able to change shape very slowly. So we have discovered in our brief history of the world that the surface has moved very slightly. But we can look back into geological history using all manner of clever techniques, geochemical, um, fossil, etc., and show that actually the rocks that make up our Earth's surface have moved quite significantly in some cases. And we've called this process plate tectonics. It used to be called continental drift before we understood the process, and now we do. We call it plate tectonics. So fundamentally, uh, the Earth's lithosphere, which is the crust and the top of the mantle, is denser than the mantle itself. And that means it's inclined to sink at the edges, at least oceanic crust is. So that sinks over time. And that pulls the crust apart, and more mantle material is forced up into a ridge, which then solidifies and forms new land. And we have this process ongoing. Uh, where this gets piled up too much, you get what's called continental crust, and that's always too low density to sink. And so you end up with the continents forming. So this basically is the process of how you make continents, because you make these thin layers that are sometimes the sediment gets built up and built up and built up and you start making mountains and things and that continental crust then won't sink anymore. Okay, so convection currents in the mantle uh, driven by sinking cold oceanic crust cause the movement of the tectonic plates on the surface. Let's have a look at some images. I mean, you can see satellite image with very high resolution. You can see these boundaries down the center of the major oceans. These are constructive plate margins. They are divergent plates where the plates are moving apart and creating new land. And some of them are, there's some constructive bits down here, even on conservative boundaries. Okay, there we are. I've doodled on that so you can't really see it. But you can see those plate boundaries drawn in. Um, and the horizontal lines are the uh, conservative plate boundaries where things are neither created nor destroyed, just move past each other. We'll get to the boundaries in a bit. So there we have some set. If you want to put those into order, feel free to do so. That's a list of statements describing convection in the mantle and uh, how it drives plate tectonics. Pause if you'd like to have a go at putting those into order. All right, here's a little animation just showing how the Earth's history has changed. So this is how it looked 320 million years ago. And this is a supercontinent of Pangaea slowly breaking up. Let me leave that running. Oh no, I'm gonna have to animate through it. You can see that over time, Continents have rearranged themselves. This is getting more into Pangaea. And then Pangaea starts to break up and start gondwana land forming. And then Inda, Inda starts its run from Antarctica to go very, very far from the continent. Over and smashes into Asia and builds the Himalayas. Oops. And we've got some evidence for this, of course, if you really want to look into details. There's what's called the magnetic spreading, at, or magnetic magnetic. Uh, patterns that are recorded at the spreading ridges where you've got a constructive plate boundary. The rock that is being produced traps the Earth's magnetic field in miniature. And so you can actually see which way Earth's magnetic field is polarized when the rock formed. And our field swaps around every couple of hundred thousand years or so. And so you make this much land in a hundred thousand years, magnetic pole swaps, so south is north, north is south. You make the opposite polarity rock for a bit, swaps back, you make the opposite polarity rock for a bit. And you get these magnetic stripes in the seabed, which is a nice little historical record of how slowly the Earth has been making new crust and how the Earth's poles have been occasionally magnetically swapping over. Right, just another bit more extension. If you want to know how the mantle can possibly flow, 
Here's a picture of a crystalline structure. We've got covalent bonds here between crystals. And as we apply massive forces and high temperature, we break one bond and those atoms start to migrate their bonds to the next atom. It's like a liquid flowing, it's just regrowing new chemical bonds. Right. All of this tectonics, of course, leads to some interesting geological activity, taking us full circle back to the beginning of the PowerPoint where we were talking about earthquakes and the movement of these plates, the sudden slip stick mechanism. You get it, suddenly they hold for ages, and then as the pressure builds up, suddenly they break, or the strain builds up, suddenly they, that, that fracture fractures and moves a lot of earth quite a long way. You get these sudden shocks called earthquakes, which can be terribly devastating. And of course, we also get volcanoes where you have molten rock close to the surface that can depressurize and either explode or flow onto the surface, giving us either spectacular explosions and deadly explosions or fields of lava, which are much less threatening to life. Examples of Montserrat. So these, of course, all tie up along plate boundaries to show you what kind of things are happening. So this is the Pacific Ring of Fire around the edge of the Pacific because of its nature of there's loads of destructive plate boundaries. You've got a lot of very exciting volcanoes that form around the edge of the Pacific Ocean because destructive plate boundaries tend to take down lots of volatiles and make earthquakes, uh, make, sorry, not earthquakes, volcanoes erupt much more dramatically or prevalently. And you can see tectonically active areas in the world tend to be marked with volcanism. And also, you can see there we go, lots of plate boundaries showing where the plate boundaries line up with volcanic activity. These are, um, you can actually go to this website if you want to, um, but you may have to email me to see if I can remember the name of it. I think it's called the National Earthquake Geographic Survey, and it just gives you a live update of all the earthquakes that have happened recently. So when I took this screenshot, the circles are earthquakes that had happened in the previous 24 hours. All the pink dots are earthquakes that have ever happened in their records. So you can see they are very specifically clustered along the lines of those plate boundaries, those tectonic margins, and particularly along these destructive boundaries. And you can see all the big ones, these big circles gives the magnitude, they happen on these destructive boundaries, particularly on this particular area of the Pacific where there's some very active destructive boundaries around, all the way around here. Okay, let's have a look at those boundaries. So we've got three fundamental types. I know geography teach you four, uh, that's because they treat orogenics, which is collision of continentals, as still a plate boundary, whereas my degree in geology, or ge not geology, geography, uh, yeah, geology, not geography, geology, uh, my degree talks about once you've got two continents colliding, then it stops really being two different plates and just becomes kind of a mush of one pl of two plates stuck together, which is just more continental crust. It's not really a boundary anymore. So we've got uh, conservative, move past each other, constructive, where the plates pull apart and make new uh, material in between and destructive where the lithosphere sinks beneath and they've all got interesting features so yeah earthquakes caused by sudden movement volcanoes caused by um, melts occurring generally because there's increased volatiles present like water or carbon dioxide and then that pressure causes a rock to, or that, that volatile content causes rocks to melt more easily and that liquid rock then finds its way up and particularly if it's got pressurized volatiles in it can then do exciting things. So the first margin is conserv uh, constructive where you make new rock by pulling the surface rock apart and the gap is then filled up with new rock and we get decompression, decompression melting which has got the very very scientific word adiabatic melting. Uh, this gives us small volcanoes and even smaller uh, earthquakes. Uh, we've got destructive, where a plate, from a, a oceanic plate, subducts underneath an, a um, less dense continental plate, and because this is pulling down seawater and all kinds of other things, you get a load of melting going on here. And as this sinking plate breaks apart and fractures, you get massive earthquakes, and you can also get volcanoes with full of uh, those nasty volatiles that make massive eruptions. So all the big scary volcanic eruptions you can imagine from history or geography, those big explosive ones tend to be at destructive margins where you get volatiles that can make them do dramatic things. Uh, lastly, we have got conservative transform, which is just where two plates are sliding past each other. These can lead to very big earthquakes as well, like the San Andreas fault line, but um, they don't tend to give much by way of volcanism. You don't tend to get much by way of uh, 
volcanic activity until you get to a constructive bit. So those are our main boundaries, and that really does conclude the quite a lot of extra in the lesson. Well done for sitting through it all. If you have um, spent a lot of that going, what? Then fair enough. M the things you need to know are the four key layers of the Earth and the components of the atmosphere. Uh, it's really good science to know how we have that data, so understanding a little bit about the idea we might use seismic waves and satellite data and a small amount of mining to get that information would be brilliant. And understanding plate tectonics is it's not really very much on the GCSE science specification anymore. So I feel that cutting it out really does narrow your curriculum a lot because geography teaches it subtly differently and include words like liquid when describing the mantle and the mantle is very emphatically not a liquid. Anyhow, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, feel free to send me feedback. Hopefully my next few PowerPoints will be a bit less uh, content heavy, but bear in mind the content you need to know is only on a couple of those slides. The rest of it is there as extension. Okay, uh, ha have a very nice day, stay safe, take care. So if you want to have a go at some summary questions, there are six summary questions to see how well you've been listening to what I've been saying. But to be fair, I think I'll just say goodbye and have a good day.